Christchurch, March 2019, 49 people killed in mosques in New Zealand. October 2019, two people killed by an extremist in uh, Halle, Germany, who tried to attack a synagogue. This February, 10 people killed in Hanau, Germany, by an extremist, killing 10 people hanging out in shisha bars. Three incidents, three attacks by ex ex extremists, by racists, who also showed all the material on social networking sites before their attack, even going so far to share their footage online on, we heard, Amazon, um, on Twitch, which is an Amazon service, and send it over to thousands of people. This made me thinking about the role of social networking sites towards extremism or radicalization. And so I would like to talk to bed today about the role of social networking sites in this context. First of all, I would like to see hands. It was uh, already introduced, showing hands. So what do you think? Do social networking sites, so uh, in short, SNS, spur extremism? So do they enhance extremism? What do you think? Do you think yes, please? OK, I think this is the majority. And who thinks no? No single person. All right. OK, so let's find out. Um, what the next couple of minutes uh, tell us about uh, social networking sites. So first of all, maybe so you all know social media. Uh, and this is kind of the umbrella term for what all the social networking sites also belong to. Back in the days, we had a communication model which was monodirectional. So you consumed the newspaper or the TV, done. Today, you create content, and it became a multi-directional communication model. So, for example, you do not only read the newspapers, but you maybe also upload a poochy selfie with your dog who looks at the tennis ball on top of your phone. And so you create content. You become a producer. You're not only using the service anymore, so Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, whatever, you name it, but you also produce content. So we have a switch here. And the social networking sites um, are network communication platforms, and you know all the examples. Twitter is also one. Facebook is one. Also, Wikipedia is basically one. Um, and you have uniquely identifiable profiles there, and they come from user-supplied content. So you say, hey, my name is Konstantin. I'm a male, and I'm 27 years old, for example. Secondly, you have publicly articulated connections. So, for example, when you and I connect on Facebook, you can observe this, basically, if you like and uh, follow us. Thirdly, we have user-generated content. So, think back to the Pucci selfie. You upload this to Instagram. Suddenly, you created information. So, well, it's not information in the Pucci selfie context, but you know what I mean. So, you could also share an opinion, an article of the newspaper, and so on. So social networking sites are basically a good thing. You can see you have like can talk to basically everybody on earth, so the globe kind of comes together. And of course, these are a lot of values uh, you, we all consume a lot. So maybe you got to know someone in New Zealand you liked a lot. Now you can share your life, your stories, your opinions with him or her on a daily basis which is, of course, for values such as friendship, a good thing. You can share the stories. You get closer together. And maybe you can also think back to the Arabic Spring, where all these social networking sites had a tremendous effect. So moreover, next to the societal values, it also may have uh, env environmental or economical values, because you do not have to fly to New Zealand every time to see your friend, but you can share everything online, which is a good thing. Talking about stakeholders, then, we, of course, have the direct stakeholders. These are all of us, the users. These are the suppliers of the platform. But moreover, there are, of course, also a lot of indirect stakeholders. So all those people who cannot observe the discussions we, for example, have because they do not have um, a connection to social networking sites, maybe they do not have internet, maybe they are, the service is not offered, Maybe um, they are discriminated. Maybe they cannot see and observe the group's discussions on Facebook because they simply have no, um, no access to it. So, and you feel like this comes closer to a trade-off at some point, and we will get back to this in a couple of minutes. But 
Um, furthermore, what is extremism? Because that's a term which is uh, widely used nowadays. Basically, it's just a political ideology that opposes a society's core values. We talked about democracy a couple of minutes ago. That's basically one for, the, for Switzerland and also universal human rights. So equal people, all people are created equally and so on. And everybody in every ideology who opposes or that opposes these values is basically an extremist one. You can think of ISIS, so the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, for example. You can think of far-right ideologies like all these people shooting, people praying in mosques or synagogues like uh, neo-Nazis and so on. So they are all opposing the society's core values. And radicalization is simply spoken the process to get there. And clearly, uh, these points are something we do not want to see on social networking sites. These are not values, what we consider to be values, to think about people in different um, values. They are not uh, um, created equally. So I selected three topics which might be interesting for this context. First of all, filter bubbles. Secondly, targeting ads. And thirdly, echo chambers. And let's start with the filter bubbles. Filter bubbles are an implicit personalization of prediction engines, so for example, of algorithms we heard in the uh, previous talk, and they are tailored to a specific set of users, which makes the information and the knowledge you see online personalized. Good thing, because we do not want to scroll through all the feeds on Facebook each and every day. The problem is it becomes selective, and through becoming selective, the filter bubble is invisible. So you do not really observe you are in a filter bubble and you might not each and every time you see an information on Instagram or whatsoever think, huh, is this, all, uh, is this a filter bubble or why is this, is this exposed to me? So you perceive this information to be unbiased. And talking again about values, there we have we lost kind of track about the freedom of bias which we want basically to see there. There is empirical evidence about filter bubbles which have been empirically observed, and I can uh, recommend the three uh, sources if you like, um, but right now we cannot touch on these due to time constraints, basically. So let's move on to targeted advertisement. We had the discussion about capitalism and profit orientation just a few minutes ago as well, and um, profit orientation of these social networking sites, of course, is also a thing because Facebook and Twitter do not offer this service because they like humanity that much. They offer these services because they want to create money. And the advertising is their primary income source. There's nothing which pays them more than advertising because, as you know, these services are free. You pay in different terms with your data and so on, but of course they do not just want data, they want also the money. And the problem about this is that there is personally identifying information which can uniquely identify you, so each and everybody, basically. And this is a study, um, they looked into Facebook data, and they found, for example, that if you want to target with your advertisement, let's just say, an Indian uh, population, you maybe should more talk about motorcycles and maybe not so much about very conservative US politics. So we saw in the filter bubble case that the, the information which is shown you has a certain tendency to give you information and knowledge that suits your attitudes, that suits your interests, and suits what you are basically doing. And what these targeting ads can do is that they make profit out of this. So they show you the ads that, um, may, uh, that you may find interesting, so you buy something or whatever. This has been done in the Brexit campaign, for example, a couple of years ago, and it has proven to be very, very successful. And uh, even some sources say it might have been like the, the last couple of percentage points needed to get this referendum to Brexit, actually. And you can find all these advertisements online now. They have been published, and it is quite interesting to scroll uh, through them and just see what they are doing. And... Uh, how sometimes uh, xenophobic they are. So we have the filter bubble. Now in the filter bubble we see targeted advertisement, so it gets thinner and thinner. Problem is now what could arise are echo chambers. Echo chambers is a term defined by Sunstein, which you might know from the nudging principle. 
And um, conversations in echo chambers are divided into subgroups. And this division follows some ideological lines. So, for example, if you and I do not agree on a topic and you're on this side of the um, ideological line and I'm here, we basically do not talk to each other anymore. So you talk with your peers, I talk to my peers, that's it. So the problem that emerges is that we hear our own opinion, the own facts that are relevant for this opinion over and over and over again. So we, we believe them at some point to be true, especially maybe sometimes they are not true, but even if they are true, we kind of get radicalized maybe because we are surrounded by this information all the time. In the next step, then, the principle of homophily comes in. Homophily tells us that we are more probable to form social ties to people who are similar to ourselves. So whenever I consider someone to be similar, I say, well, yeah, might be a friend. But if we are not considering someone to be similar, we say, like, ah, no, maybe that, that doesn't work out. So we have maybe even the social ties, and then again in these subgroups, we are still debating in our ideological framework. And the problem that emerges is now, especially if one of these sides is considered to be extreme, then the communication of this party decreases tremendously to all other parties, and the fragmentation increases tremendously again to all other parties, even to those people who have a more moderate point of view about this topic an, an extremist might find interesting, um, so the fragmentation starts, sometimes also called polarization, and this might end up in um, radicalization, basically. And then we are pretty close to uh, very hard uh, extremist views. And this is something, thinking back to the attacks from Christchurch, Halle, and Hanau, um, where we could see that these people were very, very active in their own groups, and really, they showed weapons, they bought weapons, and so on. So there is an impact of these chambers. So this might be dangerous, because first of all, there is social learning theory telling us that we learn deviant, so bad behavior, from other groups. So, and if these groups are extremists, like for example ISIS, they recruit a lot of people through social networking sites, this is pretty bad, also because Social networking sites are transnational, so they do not stop. They are basically like a coronavirus. They are not interested whether you're Swiss, German, Austrian. They just get across the border and um, influence people all over the globe. Again, think back to Christchurch and uh, Halle, the Halle attacker. He was pretty much influenced by the Christchurch guy because they actually live-streamed. They uh, had the same kind of worldview they used the same services and so on. So we can clearly see that there is a connection between these two attacks. And thirdly, opinions can be manipulated pretty easily because we can, in these echo chambers, maybe through targeting advertisements or something similar, in these filter bubbles, implicitly and nudge sometimes even opinions. But... But the internet alone does not radicalize you. The internet is a tool. You don't go online shopping for shoes and accidentally become a jihadist. That's a rough statement, but still, um, there is some, uh, some truth to it, because the polarization is context-specific. We could observe echo chambers, for example, for the US election in 2012. We could not, could not observe echo chambers for the Boston Marathon bombing one year later. So it seems to be context-specific. Moreover, we all do not consume only one medium. We have a range of media diversity, uh, and this reduces the probability of ending up in an echo chamber, as well as interest in politics generally. The, f the f crucial point, in my opinion, is now that it is more the dissimilar offline contacts that push people towards like-minded groups or people on social networking sites. And this is what Mrs. Saltman means with kind of catalysators. So you're getting online and you will always find someone who has the same worldview than you have. So it is much more easy today to, to find these people and then to kind of radicalize together. What could we do about this? Because... In, in, the, in the last, or we want to use these social networking sites because they generate values we 
really want to see. We want to keep in touch with people on the other side of the globe and so on. But we also want not these things to happen and think, uh, people radicalizing in these social networking um, sites. So first of all, we could identify messages by extremists. There are human-machine collaboratives uh, that already do this and filter out extremist opinions. You might see this when you read opinions uh, in newspapers that some, uh, some person deletes messages. This could maybe be done by AI. Well, back to the discussion. Um, then we could also identify potential filter bubbles or echo chambers. This is not that difficult, as I now read, because you can, by number of pages or groups liked, and which, which kind of uh, pages these are, you basically can identify these filter bubbles, and this is also empirically done in research papers. So it should not be uh, a very, very big problem to do this on a bit, uh, broader scale. And then, and I think this is really to... because. All this is basically just making it better. So we know we cannot be perfect, but let's get better with it. But in the end, maybe we should also think about changing the organizational structure of these social networking sites. Because just generating profit as, your, um, as value for these sites is maybe not enough. So maybe two examples here for the first one is uh, Moots, uh, so massive open online deliberation platforms. These are platforms where more informed, balanced, and um, yeah, deliberation processes should take place. So they are transparent, they are moderated, and so they are kind of there is an interaction involved, which makes it more human, so to speak. And the next step is maybe one step further is to have social bots functioning as a devil's advocate. So this I thought was very interesting because I talked to David Lanius, who's researching on this topic at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and there in the debate lab, and he told me about social bots who can basically tell you whenever you post something, when you share an article or whatever, you could in fact have a devil's advocate who tells you, well, is this the truth? Is this really... What, what you think, or have you looked at the other side of the coin? And then maybe provide you with some additional material telling you that, whatever, that there are also other, uh, other opinions out there you should, uh, you should follow. And maybe by changing these organizational structures and applying more technology to technology, we could end up in a state uh, where we really can make the best use of social networking sites in the sense we want to see, hopefully. So, yes, I'm looking forward to a uh, discussion, and I hope I could uh, tell you a little bit about uh, whether it really radicalizes or not. Thank you.